So, um, welcome back for the uh, closing session for our uh, spring um, 2017 member meeting. I hope you've enjoyed uh, Albuquerque, and I hope also that you've really in both enjoyed the meeting and found it um, informative and valuable. Uh, I know that the sessions that I went to uh, were great. Um, obviously, uh, as some of you well know, you can't cover them all, but uh, there were some really, really um, uh, fabulous sessions, I thought. So the place I guess I'd like to start is with a round of thanks for all of the presenters. Um, uh, you're the ones, of course, that have made this conference what it is, and uh, we all thank you very much for your efforts and your contributions. I'd like to especially thank our volunteers who were kind enough to come and help uh, do some of the AV capture um, along with our AV team. Uh, much appreciated, and I'm delighted to say that Diane tells me it looks like all of the talk captures have come out well, so you can look forward to um, those finding their way onto the CNI website over the next weeks, and um, we'll, of course, announce the availability of those as they uh, come out on CNI Announce. Um, I also want to mention um, in the AV area that uh, I was very surprised by the turnout um, for my report out session on the um, institutional repository roundtables. We had taken audio of that really to help us in writing the report, but um, since there were um, people who I guess couldn't quite fit into uh, the room, uh, we're going to go ahead and put that up with the other um, with the other session recordings. It'll be audio only, but it might be of some uh, value to uh, some who wanted to see that and weren't able to. Um, I also want to extend a special thanks to the um, CNI staff. The logistics around this meeting were a little more complicated than usual, but um, Everybody, and most especially Jackie Udell, uh, who many of you have met at the registration desk, uh, did an amazing job of uh, making it all come out perfectly. So thank you all very much. <laughs> One final note. Um, is uh, I had an email from our colleagues at the JISC uh, this morning, and I will send out a formal pulled the date announcement um, shortly, but uh, we have now scheduled the joint uh, JISC-CNI uh, meeting for Oxford um, in the UK from the 1st to the 3rd of July. Um, we'll make more information on that available as we uh, put it in place but in case you want to just put a note on your calendar. And with that, I've got one more treat for you. Um, I was just so pleased that Amy Brand's schedule um, allowed her to come and join us and share some of her thinking. Um, Amy is quite an amazing person in that she's... Um, she comes to the whole scholarly communication process from many, many different angles. I mean, she is a, um, she is a trained PhD cognitive psychologist, and um, she has worked in uh, scientific and academic publishing. She's been uh, an administrator at Harvard. Um, she has worked in the private sector and came back um, pretty recently to MIT Press, um, which is a wonderful place for her to land as their new director. Um, 
MIT Press is an organization with a tremendous history of innovation um, in everything from what they publish, uh, and you know they're really responsible uh, for um, trailblazing several new you know subfields of knowledge over the past 30 years or so, but also in their enormous flexibility in trying various kinds of uh, things about how they publish um, and working with authors. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about university presses in the digital age and what happens to them, uh, what their new role is. We've seen many university presses beginning to transition from being these sort of freestanding um, organizations to becoming a part of the library and reporting to the library, um, as is the as is the case at MIT, and um, that's really uh, opened up a whole new set of avenues and questions and. Um, I'm just, I can't think of a better person to um, give us this kind of multi-perspective um, uh, look at the possible futures of a, a university press. So welcome, Amy, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction uh, and to everyone at CNI for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts about the future of university-based uh, publishing and, and also to the audience for sticking it out into the end of the meeting. I had a conflict uh, yesterday, so I didn't arrive until last night and I missed yesterday's sessions, but the ones that I attended today were really, really excellent and so this is quite humbling, uh, but it's also um, a real pleasure and a real honor. So uh, Paul Courant, um, who is well known to this audience for his work on the economics of universities and the economics of libraries, uh, as well as his work on things like Hathi Trust, and he's now a, a, acting provost at the University of Michigan, uh, wrote in an article in the Journal of Electronic Publishing back in 2010 about university presses that they, uh, quote, confer a warm glow to the local university in recognition of the service provided to the system of scholarly publication, um, and the article goes on, but that they are, in effect, really uh, inessential in the university's excellence um, beyond that. Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, Harvard and Yale, just to pick two excellent universities, and there are many others, um, would still be excellent universities if they didn't have the excellent presses that they have. Um, and it may come as a surprise to you, but I take no issue with that. In fact, I, I concur. Uh, completely. On the other hand, I suspect we would all agree that they wouldn't be such excellent universities if they didn't have the great libraries uh, that they have, you know, from the perspective of their own faculty and students, um, in terms of their research output and their reputation, um, because libraries and librarians are really integral uh, to that knowledge discovery process. They provide valuable resources to it. Um, and let's be honest, the members of their communities uh, would be able to publish and disseminate their work regardless of whether or not their university had its own uh, press. Now presses, on the other hand, um, provide resources in support of the curation and dissemination of scholarship to the academic community uh, writ large. Um, and in fact, we press directors kind of like to brag about the fact that a very small percentage of our authors uh, actually come from our own universities. Um, lest anyone think that we are a vanity operation. I got very interested in this, um, and I recently conducted a, a sort of a spur of the moment uh, survey on the AAUP director's uh, listserv. I got about 50 responses in 12 hours. It was really amazing because AUP hasn't been collecting this information in the past, and many people were interested in it, and it wasn't quite what I expected. What I expected was that the larger, and therefore, um, implicitly, the more prestigious the university press, um, the smaller the percentage of authors um, would be coming from the home institution. And in fact, what I found is that many small presses have minuscule representation among their own faculty. So this, this first one to five percenter bar consists um, of very many small university presses. And I think that that's because you know, the focus of those presses doesn't really 
um, in, in some of these cases doesn't really align with the academic strengths of that institution. But that's not, you know, that doesn't mean that those presses um, aren't important to the, that broader system of publishing. So this is really interesting data that we're still um, digging into. Um, the bottom line is that the mean percentage across all the presses is about a 10% um, across the board. So, uh, you know, uni university presses have different strengths, they have different missions, they have different uh, relationships, financial and otherwise, um, with their institutions. Um, but we do form a multi-university collective for academic peer review uh, and credentialing in book-centric fields. And that's really an enduring, uh, you know, part of our relevance, and that's the ecosystem of scholarly publishing referred to in, in Paul's article. Another uh, really interesting thing to emerge from that uh, quick survey and the data uh, was about publishing services. So a few of the responses um, were like this one, and I'm, I'm just not naming the press because I hadn't sought permission to do so before this meeting. Uh, in this press, they said, well, our number is probably around 5% for a 16 campus system, but if you include the publishing services division that we started a couple of years ago, it would jump to 30%. And so this really resonates with the future of university-based publishing, more focused on serving uh, the publishing needs of um, the host institutions. And I'll talk at greater length about what this means for the MIT Press and how I think about uh, providing publishing services at MIT in a way that doesn't you know, otherwise dilute a reputation built on being, built on being highly selective, because um, that's been a real concern um, among our staff members and our editorial board. So uh, Cliff mentioned something about my past. I did my PhD in cognitive science at MIT in the 80s. Uh, and when I was a student in the 80s there, um, the MIT Press um, generated enough in profits that it indirectly contributed to my research stipend uh, before my advisor at the time was able to add me to his own uh, grant. I think it was a, a Sloan grant. Um, and so those days of the press being in a position to provi provide funds back to the institute for academic purposes um, are gone, uh, at least for now. Uh, it could change in the future. Um, from a budgetary perspective, though, the institute groups the press with um, entities like dining services because we're still more of a revenue center uh, than a cost center. And when I was an acquisitions editor at the MIT Press in the 1990s, I don't recall generating a, uh, a publishing a single you know, professional scholarly book with an initial print run of less than 1,200 copies because we could always uh, count on the global academic library market uh, to purchase, say, you know, two-thirds of that initial print run. Um, and uh, no such luck today um, when most academic libraries have you know, severely reduced uh, their print uh, purchasing in favor of digital collections. And so another thing I'm going to talk about is what we're doing at the MIT Press uh, to meet uh, the interests and needs of libraries in uh, digital books. So as a university press director of um, a still you know, very successful and, and largely financially self-supporting university press, continuing to do exactly um, what we've done is just not on the table. You know, the markets have changed, um, the needs and, and um, demands of our authors have changed, um, you know, if we didn't change, essentially it would be kind of continuing this, this uh, slow but certain uh, decline, um, which no one um, that I work with is interested in doing. Um, and so the legacy that I hope to create as a director will really future-proof the MIT Press with new sustainability models that are consistent with our values um, around experimentation, which Cliff talked about, and, and openness. So when you walk into um, the offices of the MIT Press uh, in Cambridge, it's about a half mile from MIT's campus now, um, there's a really nice display wall of books. And it's a regular reminder to me when I come into the office in the morning um, about my responsibility to these books. And I think about it in a couple of ways. Um, I think you know we have um, these beautifully produced, often very expensively produced print books. Uh, and it's our job to get them out into the world and into the hands of people that are interested in, in them. Um, at the same time, there are now digital files for all of these books in circulation, and are we doing everything that we can to make sure 
um, that all this copyrighted content is accessible and searchable and discoverable uh, now and into the future, um, and particularly in an environment where almost everything that we publish digitally gets pirated. Um, so what does that mean for book authors, and in particular authors of trade books and textbooks, because we publish not only professional books, but also trade books and textbooks, um, you know, who were hoping for um, <clears throat> some extra income from their book writing efforts. Uh, writing a book, after all, is, is uh, no small undertaking. Uh, for many people, it takes years and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and I was giving a talk recently at a, a library conference in Charlotte, and I mentioned an impressive statistic around ebook um, pirating. And one of the librarians in the audience uh, was really taken aback. And I was, I was taken aback that he was so taken aback. And during the Q&A, he said, you know, I'll never let my provost know that all these books are freely available, you know, authorized or unauthorized, because it would only mean further cuts to my already shrinking budget. And here's just an example of uh, one of our lead trade titles from 2016, and I just love the irony of it being the sharing economy, um, you know, that showed up in LibGen. Um, basically a couple of weeks after we published it. Now the good news is it's still selling very well, right? And I'm gonna come back to why that is. Um, so the, the reality that the internet enables peer-to-peer -peer dissemination of published information in all forms, in all media, I think can be construed um, as a threat equally to the relevance of libraries and publishers, or as I prefer to see it, as a forcing function uh, to both to invent um, new models. Libraries and university presses, um, I think, are very much in this soul-searching together, uh, re-examining the relationship with, uh, the relevance to the constituents that we serve, uh, and working to create new roles and objectives for um, members of our staff. Um, and I do feel strongly that our academic institutions should be um, championing and protecting the presses, but I feel even more strongly that university presses as a group uh, should be controlling the narrative around what we do, um, how we differ in some ways from publicly held uh, commercial publishers in our motives and our values, and how we align with our host institutions. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. Both the MIT libraries and the MIT press um, have embraced a strategy and an action plan that at a high level construes relevance as being worthy of a place like MIT, uh, an institute that values experimentation above all else. And you heard yesterday from the director of the MIT libraries and my boss, Chris Berg, as well as my colleagues, uh, Armand and, and Heather, um, about a bold new vision for the MIT libraries and for libraries in general. Um, but what does institutional relevance look like at the MIT Press uh, today and going forward? Uh, where are we pushing boundaries? How are we partnering with the MIT libraries uh, and elsewhere on MIT's campus? Uh, first, just a little bit more about um, my background, where I'm coming from personally. Um, as Cliff mentioned, I, I was named director of the press uh, not quite two years ago in July of 2015, uh, but this is basically my 14th year, um, all told, at MIT. Um, and in the past 30 years or so, the period of time that I wasn't at MIT, I was at Crossref, I was at Digital Science, uh, I was at Harvard for a period of time working on open access and then working on policies around tenure and promotion, which is still something that I, I think a lot about. So I've inhabited you know, many regions of the scholarly communication landscape, as Cliff mentioned, books and journals, technologies, administration, startups, metrics. Um, and so I come to the press directorship with a real bias towards a more digital future and a more entrepreneurial work culture um, and a mandate from our provost and from Chris to really reimagine uh, university-based publishing. And yet, you know, lo and behold, I get back to the press and what I find is that the vast majority of our revenues are made selling print books and that's true for most university presses. Um, and I'll tell you exactly what I mean by vast in a moment. Um, so, you know, our long-lived um, romance with the form factor of the print book continues. Uh, I'm not complaining. I, I love them too. I love book art. I love books. I love everything about them. Um, <clears throat> but it does make the change that we sorely need uh, in our culture and in our work processes, you know, to really leverage the full capabilities of digital um, that much harder to affect. 
uh, just a bit about the MIT Press as well. Um, MIT um, published its first book in 1926 and was sporadically publishing books in science and technology uh, up until 1962 when the MIT Press formed. And um, so we're in university press world, that's pretty young. We're a pretty young university press, but we quickly uh, became one of the larger presses. Uh, we now publish about 250 books a year uh, and about 35 journals. And what really makes us unique is our legacy in publishing science and technology. That's not exclusively what we publish, but most university presses, as you know, are much more focused on, on humanities um, and social science. Uh, we're also one of a, a handful of university presses with a significant journals publishing program. You know, other presses that have these are Duke and Chicago, obviously, um, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, all of our journals have an APC option, but that hybrid model is very, very rarely adopted and it's not really that interesting to us. Um, we have several journals that are completely open access. We're trying to make more completely open access. Um, and we also um, have some uh, journals in the more popular space. If you've ever heard of the magazine Nautilus, it's this great popular science magazine and um, we co-publish the print edition of it. Uh, and in the art space, magazines like uh, Leonardo. So our areas of strength across all of our publishing programs are, are the ones you see listed here, computer science, architecture, design, economics, uh, neuroscience. And when I talk about this um, on, on the MIT campus, I talk about us really uh, amplifying the strengths of the institute in these spaces because we're publishing works that go beyond the research on MIT's campus, but um, very much aligned with what's going on there. Um, and, the, and the real kind of crux of the identity is this transdisciplinary art, science, design, and technology. That's a very MIT-ish thing, maybe a very M Media Lab-ish thing, but that's, that's very much the identity of the press. So one of the um, new objectives that I brought to the press is a stronger emphasis on trade publishing. Uh, and in particular, books that make research in science and technology accessible to uh, non-specialist readers, which is another priority aligned with MIT's values. Um, and just to make sure no one thinks that that means that we're no longer focused on publishing uh, course books and professional books, I just wanted to share some acquisitions data with you. Um, and it's easy to see that our editors are um, <coughs> signing up as of you know, 2015 when I got to the press, a lot more trade books. That's the blue line, that's the second from the top, but we're definitely not publishing um, fewer course books or professional books, although we're, you know, de-emphasizing some edited volumes that we published in the past and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so what this means is that uh, we're just publishing um, a lot more um, that we, than we used to. Um, and this is kind of the reaction among the staff, as you can imagine. Um, it's a scary transition. Um, we've had uh, I, I think some presses have been further along than we have in sort of thinking about what should be insourced and what should be outsourced. We've always had this very kind of high-touch, craftsman-like approach to um, editorial production and design at the press, and we don't want to lose that. Uh, but we really can no longer afford um, to have that be the only um, option. And so, you know, what is insourced and what is outsourced is, is changing. Uh, some of those roles are changing. Um, and, uh, you know, the way I think about it and talk about it at the press is in terms of the importance of project management and relationship management. So retooling existing positions and creating new roles uh, focused around these two things and, and counseling um, impacted staff um, that learning these skills, you know, how to start up a completely new initiative, how to be okay with iterating and failing, um, how to track multiple work processes uh, and manage many external and internal relationships you know, will not only help the press, but it will also help them in their own careers because those are the kinds of skills that really translate into almost any uh, workplace um, today. Um, so a bit more on the trade. Uh, so we, you know, we're publishing more crossover books um, and we're now explicitly focused on, on titles that, that spread the gospel of science. I think there are all kinds of good reasons to do that. Um, and I wanted just to stress that I think the role that uh, publishers perhaps uniquely uh, play in translating technical content, you know, science and technology for a broader reader, readership is a large part of expanding access to information. You know, yes, it's making it available, making it free, making it cheap, but it's also really making it accessible in that, in that sense. 
Um, and I'm not talking about um, you know, dumbed down blockbuster books, but books that uh, honor the complexity of their subject matter. It's a phrase I like to use that one of my, my more eloquent uh, colleagues um, had spoken. Um, and so these are books that can generate significant revenue uh, for the press. Uh, this book was one of our lead trade titles recently. I think this weekend it's supposed to be on 60 Minutes. If you missed it on the Today Show, you know, that's very exciting for us. We don't, you know, we hadn't had publicity like that in the past. Um, and this really helps support other parts of our publishing uh, program. And it's part of what has allowed us to do uh, the open access publishing that we do, with, for the most part, without any subvention. Uh, so looking a bit more at what we do in open access for books. Um, so we, we've been publishing digitally for a long time, but we only started about 10 years ago to publish absolutely every book that we publish and print in digital form as well. Um, and uh, quite frequently, although definitely not, you know, more than maybe 25%, um, we publish, when we publish digitally, we make books openly available. Um, and I can talk about how those decisions um, are made. It's generally an author requesting that we do so or our you know, assessment that this is a market that would benefit um, from that, an audience that would benefit from that. Um, and when the content is not OA, um, we are uh, moving away from DRM to a kind of lightweight um, watermarking strategy. Um, you know, as I said, we've, we've often done this without any kind of subvention. Uh, we typically find, um, although it varies, that we can still sell enough print books to make this an affordable thing to do. Um, this is the first year that we're participating in Knowledge Unlatched, and we're very excited about that, uh, and even more excited about a relationship, a partnership with the libraries where the um, Scholarly Communications and uh, Collections Directorate has decided to um, redirect uh, resources that might have otherwise gone into collections towards uh, funding a new open access book series at the press uh, focus, focused on network technologies. Um, so if, if this term of inside out came up in the library presentation yesterday, this is a great example of that uh, strategy in action and of the growing coordination between the press and the libraries. Um, the other thing on this slide was just a, a quote from a professor at MIT who's one of our authors. Uh, and this is the one example of so this, this is a, a book called Free Innovation, uh, which was published openly online, in which the author also insisted that there be a zero-dollar Kindle. Uh, and this is the first real kind of experiment that we've done where we've shown that that actually doesn't work very well. If you have zero-dollar Kindle, you're not going to sell many print books, but it was still um, worth doing. Um, and you know, we like doing these kinds of um, experiments. But it does turn out that the, um, the best selling book that we've had in a long time is an open access textbook on the topic of deep learning. Very important topic uh, right now. I think we just timed it really well because we got this book out before there were other books out there. Um, the print edition is 800 pages. It only costs about $80 before a discount, so it's affordably priced for a book of that kind, as are all of our textbooks. Um, but this content was on the web well before the book was published, and it's still up. Um, HTML on the author site, and then there are some pirated PDFs, of course. Um, but this book continues to sell extremely well. Um, now, typically with te textbooks, we're a little bit more protective. We have a separate ebook uh, textbook a rental platform. Um, but you know, authors in certain fields, and in particular computer science, are increasingly requesting an open access option. And so far, that's been working for us. And so you know, almost, even though almost everything that we publish is available in digital form, it's open, whether authorized or unauthorized open, um, <clears throat> we're still finding that individuals um, are buying print books. Um, and just to give you a sense of what these numbers mean, if you look at our domestic sales, about 95% of that um, is, is individual sales, not institutional sales. I have a lot to do that I'm gonna talk about on the institutional side, and of the, that 95%, 90% of those revenues are, are print-based revenues. The digital uh, ebook market is still quite small. Uh, very different story on the institutional side, on the library side, uh, where there's a strong preference for digital over print collecting. So, um, you know, I talk about this as a juggling act. Uh, you know, a leadership perspective, a financial perspective, the persistence of print books on the one hand, and the individual market, um, growing institutional ebook 
uh, market on the other. You know, what's the right, right way forward? And this is my answer. Um, and I'll talk about what I mean. You know, if libraries are uh, forgoing print and buying digital, um, you know, how intermediated uh, should that institutional ebook uh, strategy, sales strategy be? Um, on the one hand, it's a question of uh, institutional sales, uh, to be sure, but, uh, and the margin on those sales, but it's also a question of controlling um, our digital destiny and mission in a way that um, aligns with our, our principles about um, access to information. Um, so a central part of the future proofing strategy is designing and creating our own ebook subscription platform for libraries, uh, potentially also for individuals, like if it were a membership, um, mainly on collections of professional books. Now, I really don't like to have slides that have lots of words on them, but I wanted to spell out uh, here all the reasons why this is a good thing for us to do. It's not necessarily a good thing for all presses, but um, you know, capturing a larger percentage of those revenues, um, if we're selling directly for our authors and ourselves, uh, providing terms of access that are consistent with our values, as I mentioned, um, you know, bringing it home so that we're focused internally on digitizing and controlling our own ebook content, being able to provide much more customized collections for libraries, um, creating that kind of foundation for experimentation uh, with new functionality that I'm going to talk a bit more about. Uh, direct institutional relationships um, will really make this a lot less opaque for us and we'll get uh, you know, the user data that we really need to, to improve our publishing program as a whole. Um, we're also concerned about controlling our own brand, which has been an issue with some of the um, ebook platforms that we've worked with. Um, and then most importantly, providing a foundation for institutional uh, subvention of open access monographs. And so um, you know, that's really the thing to think about. You know, is there a tipping point at which best practice licensing terms like the Charlotte Principles um, and the fact that you know, piracy and an authorized sharing really force our hand that you know, whether you're calling it um, licensing or subsidized OA, it really is, I think, subsidized open access. And if that's the case, why should that be intermediated? Um, so that's, that was my line of thinking. These are sort of, this is sort of a rough outline of um, the, the uh, terms of the platform, which is now under construction and, and should be ready for prime, prime time uh, at the beginning of 2018. Um, and another thing that will be really different from the start is that it's designed in partnership with the MIT libraries. Um, that means not only that library expertise uh, is informing the features and functionality of the platform, but also that the libraries is actually committing uh, dedicated uh, staff hours on an ongoing basis uh, to, the, to the institutional ebook service. And so um, we're very excited about uh, yet another partnership with the libraries. Um, so I talked about library partnerships. There are a lot of other partnerships that we've undertaken uh, at the MIT Press. Um, I think when I um, came back to the press, one of the things that had changed was that the press had moved um, a little bit further away from MIT's campus. Um, but it also felt slightly more pivoted away from the institution because my experience of the press, and in, in part because I had this long relationship with MIT, was very uh, integrated with the institute. So um, we've been doing a lot of that. There are two um, fairly popular magazines that MIT publishes, Tech Review and Sloan Management Review. There was never any relationship in the past with the press, but we now have close relationships not only for publishing books together, but also um, for certain international distribution um, arrangements. Uh, very excited about a partnership with the Office of Digital Learning at MIT. Those are the folks that do open courseware and um, MITx, you know, the edX platform, uh, and found that they wanted to have very lightweight paperback print materials to accompany some of their courses. Um, and so we've started uh, partnering with them on that and have a couple of books coming out. And the nice thing about it is, you know, when you, when you end one of those courses and the platform closes for you, um, you don't necessarily have anything to take away, but a book with those materials is something to take away and could potentially um, also be of interest to, um, you know, readers beyond the people that actually took, took the course. Uh, very close partnership um, with the Media Lab at MIT and in particular around a new um, open source publishing platform created by some grad students at the Media Lab called PubPub. It's sort of like open authoring, open review platform 
with a lot of um, cool interactivity. Uh, we started last year with one journal, and we're going to be doing a lot more publishing on the platform. And then there's the publishing services stuff, the, um, the way in which we can take departments at MIT, like SA and P is the School of Architecture and Planning, CAST is the Center for Art, uh, Science and Technology, who have book publishing programs, um, but that don't have the infrastructure to do it, and we're going sort of you know, out of house, out of institute, um, and now they can use the press essentially as uh, their back office, so we are not officially publishers of these books, we just distribute these books. Um, that's nothing new. Publishers uh, have been doing this for a long time, but it is relatively new for, um, for us. So um, a bit more on the publishing services piece. Um, you know, we're finding that because we have all this capacity, capacity around um, not only editorial production and, and design, but on the marketing and publicity, the warehousing, the inventory management, um, that um, this is a capacity that we can monetize, and it's another part of uh, our model. Um, and we're using it not only at MIT, but also with some external partners. So for example, um, Goldsmiths University in the UK wanted to stand up a university press very quickly, and we were able to allow them to do that because we're just their back office. Um, and then the self-publishing piece um, is really interesting and more of a partnership with the libraries uh, through a, um, a generous uh, gift from an anonymous donor to the MIT libraries, uh, the MIT Press Bookstore, um, which I can tell you a bit, a bit more about, now has one of these espresso book machines. And so it's, you know, print and bind a book in color in four minutes. Um, and we are uh, planning to use that. We use it internally for uh, producing sort of galleys and things like that, but we're planning to use it for uh, course materials. The libraries has a range of uses um, for it um, and for just self-publishing in the community. Um, one of the things that was uh, also surprising to me when I came back, not just you know, um, that there were still all these print books we were selling, was that there was very um, little had been done to digitize the backlist. Um, we have thousands and thousands of books that are essentially not available in any form except perhaps uh, pirated um, because they're out of print uh, books from you know, many decades ago. And so that's also been a top priority uh, for, for me um, for preservation purposes, for uh, human and um, non-consumptive uses. Uh, in some cases, but this is really um, sort of the exception, there will be kind of gems in that backlist that we probably can add to the, the ebook collect collections on our subscription platform. Um, and I'm very happy to announce that we just uh, reached an agreement with the Internet Archive, who's going to um, scan and um, all of our uh, backlist books and put them in the Internet Archive for different terms of access um, through openlibrary.org. Um, Brewster Kale of the Internet Archive also has a vision around being able to provide um, those digital files to libraries that own print copies of those books. And so the, I think that that could be very, very transformative and we're really pleased to be, um, I think, the first uh, publisher jumping on board um, with, with this plan. Um, I also talk a lot about data at work. I talk a lot about metadata. It was really, one of the first hires I made was a metadata librarian. Um, at the press because I felt like we weren't really optimizing metadata for marketing purposes. But I also talk about data in terms of just business intelligence. There's a lot of data that flows through publishing houses. There's certainly data about, about sales, but um, a whole range of other um, data that I just felt we weren't making the best, best use of. Um, and so we're very focused now on, on um, you know, enhance financial analysis and, and more interoperability across our systems. So that's a key part of the strategy. And another key piece is uh, community development and outreach. And so I talked about the press being, um, having been somewhat insular, I think, for a time. Um, we, uh, as a result of this incredible bookstore that we have, which is very unusual for a university press, um, and it sells books not just at the press, just it sells um, other publishers' books in these topic areas, um, we have a forum that we can use for our authors and for the community. And so we've launched a very active series of author events that engage not just folks at MIT, but also the local biotech and innovation community. These are just pictures of some of our authors. And it's really doing a lot to elevate our profile on campus. Um, 
And you know, the staff were a little concerned, again, about this different type of activity, um, but we had a very quick win um, in the following sense. There was an author we had reached out to, a, a well-known academic at Harvard Law School, that we'd reached out to to ask if he would be willing to serve as a commentator on one of the other author talks. And he said, absolutely not, I don't do that, how dare you ask me, in effect. Um, but, but he said, but I have a book coming out, um, would you like to, so we said, sure, that's great, and we actually signed him up, and so, you know, he's very happy about that, and a couple weeks later, we get a call, would you like to publish my next book? And this was um, an author that I know that my editor in, in, you know, law and economics would never have thought was in her grasp. Um, and so I think, it, you know, as I said, sort of raising the profile, being out in the community has all kinds of benefits for us, and I think, and the community. Um, and so I'm just gonna run through very quickly sort of a range of technologies and new dissemination models that we're currently experimenting with. I mentioned Nautilus Magazine. If you haven't seen it, it's a great magazine. The MIT Press now has its own channel, so we can take excerpts of our books and journals and make it available to this much broader audience through Nautilus. Um, we're also um, a new partner in a New York public, public library program that provides ebook content for download to writers on the New York City subway system. Um, and so this is getting our books out into a different community entirely. It's a form of providing free content and of, of um, really a form of marketing as well. Um, we are, um, are an early adopter of Hypothesis for annotation on our um, digital platforms. Um, we were a partner with JSTOR on its topic graph project of providing kind of a, a look inside the book on semantic steroids, right? That you could do this analysis and pull out uh, keywords and people and places and have a view of a book that showed you um, the frequency of those key items and, um, and where they occur in the book as a useful tool to uh, students and, and readers of all kinds. Um, you know is another player in that space. You might know them from their um, library conceptual search a tool, but they also are working to develop tools for publishers that provide them with visibility into um, the conceptual makeup of their publications. And so, you know, you can have this kind of view at the book level for deep learning. There's more computer science in it than, you know, engineering or at the chapter level. Um, and there are a lot of really interesting inter internal applications of, um, you know, I think for, for publishers that we're um, exploring and helping them develop. Um, we have implemented Altmetric into our book platform so that you can come and see the attention in social media and news and elsewhere paid to publications. But the really exciting thing about um, that implementation is that authors uh, automatically get an alert um, telling them um, about the activity on their, on their book. So you can, the authors of Distracted Mind can see uh, the news outlets, um, Twitter and blog and blogs and Facebook, and you can go through and actually see the content in these things. But what I really like about this is that it, we're giving authors you know, information that they can use to, to really kind of provide that richer narrative around um, the impact of their, their research. Um, I mentioned uh, the PubPub platform. This was the first journal that we published on it. This is sort of what it looks like on the inside. If this were a live demo, um, this image would be an animation. Um, it's, it's a very cool platform and a very, very active um, uh, kind of commenting um, functionality. And what we discovered was it's not like you build it and they will come, right? If you, if you want to publish as community and conversation, it requires a dedicated relationship, um, community management, and someone who's curating the conversation. And so with our plans to add more content, um, to the PubPub Pub platform, both books and journals, we were actually hiring someone who is a community manager um, in order to make this successful. Um, and so because we take this experimentation thing um, so seriously, uh, and it's a key to our strategy uh, in building um, you know, the kinds of integrations I talked about, our plan is to develop a publishing futures lab at the press um, that will include um, expanded software development uh, capabilities and support the initiatives that I talked about. But another piece of the plan um, that's kind of coming together now, it's not finalized yet, is to actually have uh, an incubator at the press for um, 
open science, um, open source startups um, that want to be in the environment of a publisher and a library. I mean, physically, I think they'd be in our space because we have a little bit more available space right now than the libraries, but it would be a joint effort. And these are, these are um, you know, young people and young companies that are approaching us um, and are saying, you know, I have like the PubHub platform and there are a couple of others, you know, that want to be able to be with like-minded people um, thinking about um, the tools and capabilities that they're um, developing. So I hope to have more to say about that soon. Um, so I talked about um, really, you know, not, not quite two years in what we're doing according to this strategic roadmap um, that we set for ourselves. Um, <clears throat> some of these efforts are in coordination with the MIT libraries. Um, some aren't, um, but overall there's a great deal of complementarity. And I do think that, that often, um, not always, the discussion around the growing role for libraries in scholarly publishing is, is misunderstood. I mean, at least the implication that libraries are assuming the core function of publishers um, can be somewhat hand wavy. Again, not always. There are real things like new journals that, that um, you know, libraries are, are um, hosting on OJS. Um, but I think it's because the term publishing can mean so many different things. You know, we use it to include things like open access repositories for, for articles and data um, and other artifacts. So I started off talking about university presses providing a collective, a system for, for peer review, um, libraries and publishers both being disintermediated. Uh, and I want to go out on a limb here and end on a completely different type of, um, I think, overly intermediated ecosystem that I believe institutions should be paying more attention to, and that's namely uh, control over the record of scholarship itself, by which I mean the metadata record. And this came up a lot today. It came up in, in Jeff Builder's talk. It came up um, in, in Cliff's remarks. Um, but I do think you know, US universities as a group have been pretty slow to recognize these broader um, systemic forces that would compel them to take um, you know, management of their own research information and outputs um, more of a priority. And they've also uh, deprioritized the kind of cross-university collaboration on infrastructure uh, that would um, reduce the void that you know, commercial enterprises like Web of Science and Scopus or uh, ResearchGate and Academic Analytics um, now so successfully fill because there is a real need um, for that kind of you know, cross-university um, nexus of information. But the result is that universities have effectively um, or are risking abdicating control over those metrics that are typically used in evaluation um, and also over systems that support collaboration. And so if the goal is you know, more, uh, a more open system of science and of scholarly communication and a less metricized one, I think um, managing academic data is a key um, institutional component that libraries can play a highly relevant um, part in, in my view, um, you know, by, for example, um, maintaining and hosting a Vivo instance. And I, I really wanted to make a plug for that. So I could go on about uh, you know, metrics and, and metadata and analytics, because uh, I feel really strongly about it, but that's a whole other, whole other talk. So thank you very much. Any questions? I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, I'll start okay. if I can get away with it. Um, could you say, I had not realized that you had um, adopted the hypothesis uh, annotation. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little more about that and how it's going and how you're thinking it's likely to be used and by who? Yeah, so we're in very um, early stages with this and it's limited to um, our, um, we call it our Idea Commons platform. MIT Press back in the late 90s, and this was something I was involved in, created one of the early online communities called Cognet. Um, and that's where we have, that's a platform where we have control over our own book and journal content. Uh, and that's where we've implemented it. And it's purely experimental. I mean, what I've read about um, the use of um, hypothesis thus far is that there's a lot of uptake in course use. Um, and so, um, you know, if we can drive the use of our Cognet materials to course environments, I think there probably will be uptake. But I don't really have anything that interesting to report yet. We just wanted to, you know, 
We think it's a good thing. We want to see how it's going to be used. Um, the, but the, the annotation um, component of PubPub is something that we're going to be much more actively engaged in because uh, the intent is to use it as a type of open peer review, right? So we're going to be posting um, book content um, that either in um, pre-publication form or post-publication form is intended to invite community commentary. Um, and we're, we're really interested in seeing how that goes. So. So I have a question um, about the, uh, the unrealized potential of electronic books. <laughs> and um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about uh, improving citation of e-books. Uh, something that drives me crazy is uh, that there's no real standard for pinpoint citation you know, mm. for e-books. It seems like it would be trivial to do um, you know, just by everyone agreeing that we'd have like, you know, mm line number indicators or something that could be cited. But uh, yeah, I don't know, is that something you've dealt with at all? I, I haven't, though. I do feel, um, in, in part, you know, because of my background working at Crossref, but because I really do feel strongly that um, the content in professional books should be integrated into the same discovery environments as our journal content, you know, I'd really um, like to, we are moving to assigning DOIs at the chapter level to all of our books, and many publishers have done that, and I think that that will be a big help um, there, and also for discovery, yeah. Hi, I um, really liked your comment about um, when libraries talk about assuming the roles played by publishers, it can often be hand wavy. Um, that's a nice technical term. So um, as, as somebody who's done a fair amount of hand waving um, in this regard, um, and especially lately, um, one of the comments that I've received from some of my colleagues is that I get very hand wavy indeed when I get to academic peer review. So um, I realize that Somewhat surprisingly, university presses don't actually publish that much academic stuff vis-a-vis -vis the corporate sector, but I'd love to hear your ideas about academic peer review, and in particular, your thoughts about that peer review in the context of your comments about disintermediation. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm, we actually, well, two things that you said that I'm not sure I quite understand. One is that, in fact, university presses do publish a lot of academic books, and I tried to show that that hasn't changed for us, even though we are doing some trade as well. Um, but we take peer review incredibly seriously, and, and most of the university presses that I know do. We have a very um, rigorous process that is at two stages. We peer review at the proposal level, um, and then we peer review at the final manuscript level. So. I mean, typically, you know, about six, there are going to be six peer reviews on, on something before it's published at the MIT Press, um, with, you know, few exceptions. I was talking to the director of the National Academies Press recently, and she said, in, you know, for, for the reports that they issue, it's usually about 15 or 16 um, peer reviews. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, peer review is um, imperfect. Uh, in many ways, um, but I think it's the, the, the best thing that we have um, now if, you know, we're going to be making um, decisions based on quality of content and, and accuracy. Um, so does that, does that get at what you're asking, or not quite? Well, it does, except for the disintermediation. Right. It's imperfect and hugely labor-intensive. It is hugely labor-intensive. So so, Any thoughts on making it less labor intensive? Oh, yeah, so we hadn't, there are, um, I know in, um, you know, in, there are some startups that are trying to kind of disintermediate peer review and have sort of cascading peer review. So if you've submitted an article to one journal and gotten peer reviews and you don't get accepted, or the peer reviews can go to multiple journals, um, that's not something that we've looked at, but it, I, I you know, my, my gut reaction is that it's something that's so key to what we do in our processes is probably one of those things, you know, the, the effort we put into acquisitions and peer review, how we think about our own particular kind of marketing that are very key to the um, identity of, of the press and our quality control, right? And it's, it's less like those things like, you know, copy editing, which you can imagine freelancing. It's hard to imagine freelance uh, peer review. Although, as I said, there are definitely startups, you know, in that space. It's not a direction we're going in. Okay. Yeah. 
Hi, Amy. Hi. Harriet Hamasi. Yeah. From, yeah, nice to see you. Thank you so much for the comments. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the future of the scholarly monograph and in particular the uh, media-rich interactive uh, monograph. Sure. Um, we, you know, I, I'll say quite frankly that we um, don't have that much experience yet with uh, the Media Rich Interactive Monograph and the relationship that I mentioned with the MIT libraries and I talked about PubPub. Um, this is gonna be monographs that are actually published in the PubPub platform, which does allow for that. So that's gonna be our, our first um, real foray into that. There have been a couple of books, but you know, I, I often think about um, long form scholarly work from the point of view uh, more of, of the author than of the audience or the reader. You know, the, we publish these things because um, people write them for very good reasons and because we're a nonprofit you know, organization, um, we can um, you know, respond to and be uh, essentially sensitive to the needs of that person regardless of what, I mean, we're not making publishing decisions on uh, on the basis of what we predict the audience size to be. We really try to avoid that. So if something has passed peer review and it's sort of in our, our wheelhouse topic-wise, um, we figure out a way uh, to publish it um, and you know, consider it part of our, our mission and our obligation to really support long form. Um, and on the, on the sort of experimental um, side, um, I sort of, what, our vision around um, what we're gonna be doing with PubPub is that we'll have these interactive, media-rich versions of these books that we'll then publish in more of a kind of plain vanilla form um, in print, and that the uh, interactive ones, even though those have richer material, will be open uh, to the world. Um, I think there's some anecdotal data showing that, you know, for example, with, with digital textbooks that have lots of bells and whistles and stuff that, um, students, you know, have considered some of those to be a real distraction, and they're, you know, they're really interested just in the in the text, or they want to go back to the book itself, or they want to have both, and um, so that's how we're viewing that now as as highly experimental, but we definitely want to provide a place for it. I, I will. Take the opportunity to slip in one more okay. question, uh, perhaps before we close. So, one of the things that has um, puzzled me enormously for various reasons is that it doesn't seem, in many cases, to be terribly economical to be able to acquire both an electronic and a physical print copy of a book. Yet for the kind of scholarly work that you publish, um, I have to suspect that would be an ideal situation for Definitely. many individuals who want both the convenience of reading through the thing in a physical form, but then later the ease of going back and searching or, or you know, checking uh, particular passages in the electronic. Um, are you doing anything in that area or at yeah. least thinking about it? So um, this is, you know, well, well, I can consider it a sad story or sometimes I just feel like my head's gonna ex explode, but we, um, we've had a very bad um, e-commerce platform. Um, and when I came to the press, um, I hope no one's tried to buy a book from our website because it's a very painful experience. You know, and we, we um, you know, tried to, to send people to Amazon for now, but um, we, and part of that has to do with the DRM, um, but we are building a completely new e-commerce interface along with our new website and our new ebook platform. Um, and the key, one of the key reasons that we're doing that is so that we can bundle print with digital because, I mean, that's just obviously something we need to do. And I think, I think the e-commerce piece is, the new um, platform goes live in July. So we will be doing that, but you're absolutely right. Um, so, any other questions? Well, thank you very much.